Please open your Bibles to Ephesians 3. We're going to read from there in a minute. First, I want to tell you some stories. When I was little, we worshipped with the church in a Mary Moppets daycare center. And it was hard to pay attention to the sermon sometimes because there were firemen and dinosaurs and other cool cutouts and posters all over the walls that an eight-year-old was drawn to. But a couple times a week, we went to Bible class and Miss Edna Sharp taught us Bible stories, Bible songs. Songs that I still teach my kids, like This Little Light of Mine and, and The Wise Man Who Built His House on the Rock. Songs from the Sermon on the Mount. When I was 13, we lived in Virginia. And I watched my friends, my best friends, become Christians, even though I wasn't. And they talked to me. And to be honest, they pushed me. And to be honest, I was afraid to look out the window at the dark because I was so scared of hell. And the local preacher started becoming my friend. He started hanging out with me. I was just a 13-year-old kid, but he took me out boating and took me to do some cool things. We developed a relationship, and he talked to me, and he taught me. And one day he asked me, and I was baptized into Christ. When I was 18, I moved to Kentucky, didn't know anyone there, and when I arrived, somebody picked me up, brought me home. I remember the first Sunday afternoon, how lonely it was to not have a Sunday family dinner. The little things you don't think about, you take for granted, how Sundays can be empty if you're alone. But within a month, I had new best friends. I had an adopted mom, an adopted grandma. I had two Bible teachers I studied with every day who became what Paul might call fathers in the faith to me. These are stories, origin stories, I guess, of my faith. You have stories. But what these stories all have in common is they happen in the church. And by that I don't mean the church building. I mean these were God's people doing God's work as he gave it to the local church. Bill Hybels said, still to this day the potential of the local church is almost more than I can grasp. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. That's a pretty amenable statement. Everyone who was ever saved is part of Christ's church. And then he told us to gather into local groups. Churches, he called them. And that's where his work gets done. In the local church. The local church has four jobs. Evangelism, edification, benevolence of saints, and worship. As Mitch leads the study of Acts down the hall, they're going to find over and over again the church does these four things throughout the book of Acts and only these four things. This is the work that they do. And these four form a good skeleton for understanding what the church does. But let's flesh them out. Let's, if this, these are the bones, let's put some meat on those bones and get the complete picture of what the church is all about. The word pictures in the Bible gives us a different way of seeing the church. We see the pictures and we have to sit down and ask, okay, what does God want me to get from this? And we look at the pictures and as we're looking at the pictures, they become mirrors, and we can see ourselves as God wants us to be. Turn, you're already in Ephesians, so let's read from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, So that through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Through the church, God's wisdom is known. In Ephesians 6.12, we find out that the, uh, the powers and the authorities and the spiritual forces of darkness are in the heavenly places. So this isn't just talking about angels. It's talking about demons. Principalities of darkness are seeing God's wisdom where? In the church. So glorious is the church at our best that everyone can see the awesome wisdom of God in the crescendo of his creation, his church. It's important for us to realize, it's helpful for me to realize we're part of something bigger than we sometimes allow ourselves to see. What transpires in this group is not lost on the angels and the demons. God's plan, his eternal plan for salvation wasn't done with the burial and death and resurrection of Jesus. It continues today in the church. The church matters. It says here it's the manifold wisdom of God. And that word manifold means many-sided or multifaceted. It makes me think of like a gemstone. If, maybe if you're holding a many-sided gemstone in a room full of pictures, and every time you turn it, you see a different picture of the wisdom of God, of the church, how the church meets our needs and glorifies God and shows forth his wisdom. So let's look at some pictures. We're going to start out on a mountaintop, we're going to end up at a fire. And throughout, we're going to go to a flock and a farm field and visit a Passover feast. They're all different pictures, but they're all kind of the same. They're all about how God glorifies himself and meets our needs, the needs of the whole world through the church. Uh, there's three things I wanted you guys to take home from this lesson, if you only remember three things. The first is, isn't God so smart to give us the church? And in the church, to meet the needs not only of ourselves, but of the whole world. And the most impressive thing, the most humbling, shocking, crazy thing is that we need to not look at the church from a distance because the church is us. We are God's church that he's showing his wisdom in, that he's doing these amazing things in. The church is grand. The church's design is flawless. So let's just be the church of the Bible. The Bible doesn't use the word grand. It uses a different word. And that brings us to our first picture. Turn to Micah chapter 4. Uh, Ryan was in Micah 6 earlier. I told Micah Amalong we're going to spend the whole day in his book. Of course, it's God's book, but in, in the book of Micah. Micah 4, we read a prophecy of the church that was written 700 years, 750 years before it even existed. The translators of the King James kind of know how to turn a phrase. They're just really good with the English language. Uh, and they said that the church is a mountain exalted above the hills. But I don't read from the King James. I read from the New American Standard usually. So let's read the text from the New American Standard. It says, beginning in verse 1, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he goes on to say that they'll beat their swords into plowshares, Neither shall they learn war anymore. No one shall make them afraid. We'll walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. He tells us the kind of people that are going to be drawn to the church. He says, I'll assemble the lame 
and make a remnant from them. Those who are cast off, a strong nation, and the Lord will reign for them in Mount Zion forevermore. You can see the language of the prophet is poetic. It's majestic. It's full of pictures. It's different than we talk. And I just want to prepare you. I might wax a little bit poetic tonight to be true to the text. And just stick with me, and I think you'll get the point of where we're going. But there's a few questions we need to answer before we go any further into this text. I want to come back and try to figure out why is everybody all of a sudden a mountain climber climbing up this mountain and going to the top of it? Why is everybody ascending it? But first, are we even sure this is talking about the church? Isn't Mount Zion that mountain that Jerusalem is built on, the, the mountain that the temple was on? We talk about Zionists who think about Jerusalem all the time. Well, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. He says here in Hebrews chapter 12, he actually starts at another mountain, not Mount Sinai, or not Mount Zion, Mount Sinai. He says, you didn't come to that terrifying mountain where God said to every person that was, if you guys step onto this mountain, any man, any beast that steps onto this mountain, you're going to die. And he brought crazy weather like earthquakes and thunder and lightning. And the, the Lord descended in fire and smoke wrapped around the mountain. And he says, you didn't come to that mountain. You came to a much scarier, much grander mountain than that, a majestic mountain. And let's read verses 22 and 23. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the great general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Did you get that? To the church of the firstborn and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. We have come to this mountain this new Mount Zion, this new Jerusalem, this place where God's people are and God dwells, that's his church. The church of the firstborn, the assembly, the gathering of his people. So we're looking at the church. This is a picture of the San Francisco Peaks, you know, the ones in Flagstaff where Snow Bowl is. Every year, Adrian and I make our own kind of pilgrimage. You know, the Jews made their pilgrimage up to Mount Zion um, every, three times a year. We go up on my birthday up to the San Francisco Peaks. And there's a place when you're driving up, I don't know where exactly, where all of a sudden you see the snow bowl. You see the mountain. And it's, it's like, you know how mountains sometimes will just come like out of thin air? Like there's no ground beneath them. There's just air and the mountains stick up. And that's the picture I get from Micah 4. A mountain just jutting out of nowhere, exalted above the hills. Nobody's going to miss this mountain. If they're looking up, they're going to see the mountain of the Lord. And we see people drawn to it. People from every nation drawn to it. It's like Ryan brought up this morning. People flocking to the World Cup from all over the place. There's somebody from Uruguay, and there's somebody from Africa, and they're all coming to the mountain of the Lord. Peoples from everywhere. When the Jews would climb the mountain, the Mount Zion, they would sing what they called songs of ascent. And we have some of those, Psalm 120 through like 132, are songs of ascent. And one of them talked about how it says, I will look to the mountain, from hence my help will come. You know, you're walking, you're hiking up the mountain, and people start singing these songs. I look to the mountain, from hence my help will come. And we all look to the mountain because that's where God is. But here's the thing that we have to get. We are the mountain. We are the mountain, from hence the help of the world will come. God's not zapping people with the truth. God's not zapping people with the things that they need most in this life. There's a, 
a statement, a long speech from a Hopi Indian from up in the northeast corner of Arizona. And one of the elders gave this long speech and at the end he said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the church. We're the ones they've been waiting for. We're the ones we've been waiting for to do God's work. And that's what I hope we start to see as we go th through this. But they're not coming up the mountain to find us. Why do they come? What draws us? The temple. The temple's at the top of the mountain. Brian said something a while back that stuck with me. He said it in a sermon. He said, I want to build something here. And that connected with me. So we want to be building something in the church. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, or 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9 called himself a skilled master builder, toiling to build the Corinthian church. He said, and you are God's field in verse 9, God's building. And what is God's building? Skip down to verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If, verse 17 says, If anybody destroys the church where God lives, God will destroy him. The church is holy because God is here. Jesus is here. Where two or more are gathered in my name, the Spirit lives in the church, the Holy Spirit. Most of my songs are about the presence. My, most of my favorite songs are about the presence of God. You know, we sing all those songs, Be With Me, Lord. I'm drawn near to God. There's peace and there's comfort in the presence of God. But there's also something terrifying about the presence of God. And I think about the fire of the pillar of fire that led the Israelites and the pillar of smoke that descended on the temple on the tent of meeting and this great presence of God there's just nothing like God there's nothing like God there's no one like God there's nothing like God and so if God is living somewhere if he is to be here in the midst of his people, his people have to be awake. Does he have our attention? If we're not facing the reality of God, worshiping God, letting God speak, obeying him as God, we're not his church. We're just playing church, I guess. I'm here about God. I'm pretty sure you are too. And here's the really cool part. If you're here for God, you're in the right place because this is where he lives. He lives in heaven, but the church is his home away from home. Like the temple was in the Old Testament. The church is where God lives. That's why people climb the mountain in the prophecy, to meet God. I know the mystery is revealed. Colossians talks about this. But it's still kind of a mystery to me. Christ in us. God is so wise. But how do they even know to come to the mountain? How do they hear God's message? 1 Timothy 3.15 gives a picture of a pillar. It says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Why did Paul write? So we'd know how to act in the church. Because it matters what we do in the church. Because we are the only ones holding up the truth to the world. We're a pillar. Like those great load-bearing pillars of the ancient world you couldn't even get your arms around, holding up these structures. There was never a column with a more important job than the church? What if it starts to crack and crumble? Throughout history, there has been one place in all the darkness, all the problems, one thing that's holding up this message. 
See this and be free. There is a Savior. There is a way. What if we start to lose our weight-bearing power? How would you have learned the truth if not for the local church? If you think back to your stories. I could say outreach is job one of the church, but it seems more true to this picture of the pillar and of the mountain to say upreach is the job, lifting people's eyes up to the Lord, to his glory, his holiness, his goodness, to show people. And the lesson of the picture is that the church is unyielding in its stand for the truth. Are we, are we focusing on our spiritual mission? Or do we get distracted by other good causes that aren't our mission? Micah said, the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We will hold up the truth, and that's the work of evangelism. But what happens when we get to the top of the mountain? We're all there, right? We're in the church. So I guess that job was done. No. Are we done? We get the picture of a field. Back in the same passage we were looking at uh, of the building in 1 Corinthians 3.9, he said, we are God's fellow workers. You, the Corinthian church, are God's field. Remember we saw those plowshares in Micah? Why do you need farming tools? To grow. We're growing Christians here. That's, what, that's what's sprouting up in the fields. We're growing Christians. Remember the Great Commission? It doesn't stop at baptizing them. What comes after that? teaching them to do all things I've commanded you and making them disciples. And this highlights the work of edification of the local church, building up the saints. We're not just here to scatter the seed. We're here to work together to help each other grow and become more mature and more wise and stronger Christians. This picture helps me remember the purpose of Bible classes. You know, you can go... I'm guessing, I haven't looked at the list of classes, but I'm guessing you could go to ASU and find a class on New Testament literary studies. I guess that's a kind of a Bible study. But where were people learning? And who were they learning from in Micah? PhDs, the Homer Haley commentary on Revelation? It said, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. He will teach us his ways. God is the only teacher on the school of the mountain. So when we study in our Bible classes, are we teaching or is God teaching? And are we just trying to understand God's will better. Unlike watching a baptism, personal growth is kind of, it's not a dynamic thing to watch. You know, it's exciting to see somebody baptized and there's a lot of amens and it's one of the highlights of, of the year every time somebody gets baptized. But unlike that, um, I've never heard, listened to a, a tomato vine sprout. I've never watched a tree grow. Growth happens slowly, and it takes the distance of time to be able to see it and appreciate it. But it's happening here. I, I don't know if it's happening in you. That's something we all have to look at for ourselves. But you can see it. There's nothing more heartening than seeing young people become stronger Christians. Seeing older people, strong Christians, become more passionate more wise, more gentle. God's growing Christians in the church. And in the church we find security and peace. You know, Micah talked about the swords being beaten into the plowshares. He talks about, talked about us sitting under a vine and a tree, this picture of safety, and never being afraid of anybody. Where did the peace and security come from? I want to show you two pictures 
of the church to answer that question. First is the family. I did not get dad's approval to show this picture. Throughout the New Testament, the church is often called the household of God. It was actually in the pa passage we just looked at, 1 Timothy 3.15, you're the household of God, the church. It's not talking about a house, it's a household, it's a family. I love looking at Paul's goodbye at the end of the book of Romans. You may think of it as like the most boring part of the book of Romans. It's easy to skip, it's like the begats, it's just this list of names. But to Paul it wasn't boring. To Paul, Romans 16 meant something. He said, say hello to Rufus and to his mother too, because she's my mother. He talked about all these names. And there's times in this group when somebody leaves and we sing those songs like, blessed be the tie, if we never meet again, and all the women cry. And if you're leading singing, you can look out and see some of the tough guys with the little pools of water in their eyes. But geography doesn't change that much when you're family. We miss Stan and Jan and the Mosses and the Kunkels. But just like Paul said when he wrote to the Romans, he said, I thank my God for all my remembrance of you. And when he closed his eyes, he could see all their faces. Do you know there's a completely different word in the Bible for the kind of love we're supposed to have for each other? We're to have agape love for everybody, but for Christians, we're supposed to add to our agape philadelphos, that affectionate bond of siblings. Like you, I know you feel this way, when I think about you guys and Christians elsewhere, I get that goosebumpy feeling. And then one of you annoys me. <laughs> As happens in families, I get my feelings hurt or I get frustrated in my smallness because something didn't go my way. And I have to remember that brotherly kindness isn't about that blessed be the tie feeling. It's about loving you guys like Jesus loved you. It's about getting over our smallness, our pettiness, and serving each other and being Christ-like in our love and really forgiving and not even holding on to that one time she said that one thing that really bothered you and you said you let it go but it's still in your mind. Just forgetting all of that because we're loving each other like Jesus loved. And that's the difference between the family of God and all the other families. It's like everything that's good about a family. You know, real fam regular families take care of each other and we take care of each other too. That's benevolence of the saints. We take care of each other's physical needs. But beyond that, we bring Christ-like love and kindness and forgiveness. We take care of each other and we build each other up in the faith. <clears throat> Another picture that I think is a picture of security and peace and protection is the picture of the flock. You know, we have this peace in the church because of that Philadelphos. You know, that's how plowshares, our swords are beat into plowshares. That's how real peace comes. But I think sometimes we get an exaggerated sense of the peace that happens here. I'm just, I should talk about myself, not for you. I think, I'm just guessing, that things aren't always as good and peaceful and easy and going with the flow as they seem to me from my place in the church. And that's why we have elders. That's why we have shepherds. First Peter 5 calls elders, shepherds, people who are protecting the flock among you. I just have a feeling that there are wolves as Paul warned about. Wolves and storms and thieves that come into the flock and our elders chase them away. 
I think from Psalm 23, we get a picture of the shepherd's life as really peaceful and tranquil because the sheep's life is so tranquil and peaceful in Psalm 23. But in Bible times, uh, the, this was, they were warriors. They were mighty, powerful fighters, right? David fought bears and lions. Jesus said they're willing to lay down their lives. So we have these flock protectors, these leaders, these pastors or bishops. A while back, I had an email exchange with one of the elders here. Okay, it was Dale. And, uh, and I told him, I thanked him for all the spiritual mentoring he'd given me over the years. Um, I don't mean to embarrass you, but, and I could say that for all of the elders. I've known one of them all my life. And it occurred to me that that's kind of maybe a modern way of saying shepherding, spiritual mentoring, spiritual guiding. Sometimes I've gotten that picture of elders like they're the CEOs of the church. You know, they're just here to make the call on hiring the preacher and what time the service should start and make the tough decisions. And, and the picture of overseers includes some of that. But at their heart, they're shepherds, they're spiritual leaders that we can look to for guidance, for leadership. And I think it's probably easier for us to invite that leadership, that mentoring into our lives than it is for them to insert themselves into our lives. So I'd just say, take advantage of it. A lot of times it happens, you know, in the back of the foyer. Sometimes it happens over a meal, sometimes in a Bible class or in a correspondence. But they're here, they're here all the time. So we can talk to them and look to them. It said, every man walks in the ways of the Lord. But how does the church support such commitment and purity? And this comes, brings us to the picture of unleavened bread. Um, in the church, we are holy. And that's what the unleavened bread is a picture of. It's a picture of holiness. Um, I, I really like a lot of things, a lot of movies and TV shows and stories and a lot of the things that, I, I just love stories. And I have to admit that for a while, I really tried to keep up with the Oscars and cool music and things like that. But it gets tricky and it gets frustrating as a Christian when you can't really enjoy all the things that are around you and everybody's having fun with it. And that's why in the church, we so desperately need a counter culture. A counter culture, a culture of holiness, I heard in a business book once this definition of culture. The culture is the line we draw between what's tolerated and what's not. And in the church, when we're at our best, that line is drawn by God. And when we move that line, it gets easy to move it again. But when we hold one another to that standard of holiness, we have accountability. We have partnership. We have something to help us not feel so alone, and be stronger when we're dealing with the world that's out there that we have to just be totally different and be fine with being different from. And so in 1 Corinthians 5, we see this picture of unleavened bread. And he says, don't even bring a little bit of leaven into it because then the whole thing is leavened. A little bit of unholiness leavens the whole thing. And so there's a picture of discipline there, but mostly a picture of holiness. And lastly, we see the picture of the church in Revelation 1.20. We've been reading, studying from Revelation, and uh, we saw that John was in the spirit, and he uh, heard this loud noise, and he turned around, and what he saw just dropped him on the ground. It was Jesus, the Son of Man, this amazing picture where he had sword coming from his mouth, and around him were the seven lampstands, which were the seven churches. And whenever I see that picture, Jesus said, these seven lampstands, these seven candles are my, are my churches. Each one represented a local church. 
And I think about flying into Phoenix when I think about those. When was the last time you flo flew into Phoenix? You know, there's darkness under you, and if you're looking out the window, there's a point where all of a sudden you see a million lights. Cars driving around, houses, buildings. It can go for 30 minutes of just lights underneath you. And when Jesus looks down into the darkness of this world, there are lights all over the place, little candles. Some are flickering, some are blazing. There's one in San Luis, Philippines, where Rogelio preaches, and Sierra Leone, and one right here. So our job is to tend to the light. Don't let it flicker. Don't let it go out. Remember Jesus said in chapter 2, verse 5 of Revelation, I'll take it away if you don't act like my church, if you're not following me like my church. We have to tend to it, and here's why. We're the only light in this world. We are so far from perfect sometimes, but we're saints. We're the only saints. We're the only holy ones. We're the only ones to look to. Jesus used this picture of a candlestick once before in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he said, you are the light of the world. You are the candlestick. He said, a city on a hill, its light can't be hidden. There's that mountain again. And he said, nobody puts a basket on top of a light, but you let them see the glory of God through your good works. And that's our job, just to hold up the Savior. We're just the wick and the candle, the wax. He's the flame. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. He's the flame. And if he draws people to him, that's great. He will. And if he doesn't, that wasn't our job. He said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will do what? Draw all men to me. So let's lift him up. Take out your songbooks. The church, because of Jesus dying for our sins and being buried and raising again, has a great message to share, to hold up. And here it is. You have guilt for your sins and so do I. And we would be separated from God forever. We're destined for hell. But God saved us through Jesus. God saves us through Jesus whenever we believe and we repent, and we confess Jesus, and we're baptized into him to walk a new way. If you haven't studied that, that's what we're here to do. We want to sit down and study with you. And if you have and you want to do that tonight, please come while we stand and sing.